few moments later, I pinched another rote from the cup and popped it in my mouth, trying super hard not to think about what I was doing. And you have to understand, these were big-ass African-type cockroaches. They looked like giant water bugs. But I just chomped down hard and bit into this sucker. This second one, the live one, tasted kind of salty. I could feel it squirming around in there for just a beat, and then when I bit down on it, all I could think was that it was salty and gross. But I kept it down. I had to fight it, but I kept it down. And I'll be damned. I started to feel like I had a little more energy, so I ate a couple more. Ate a couple of worms, too. So that's how I got by the rest of the way, eating bugs and worms from the flower pots outside my window, switching from toilet tea to dirty rainwater tea, doing whatever I had to do to survive. That was an excerpt from Gaddafi's Point Guard, the incredible story of a professional basketball player trapped in Libya's civil war by Alex Awumi with Daniel Paisner. I'm Jason Squamata. This is the Gaddafi's Point Guard edition of Book Circle Online. From the library of Maria Menounos, this is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. I am Jason Squamata uh, for Book Circle Online. I am here with my ravishing co-hosts. Mark Savage. Kate Banker. And uh, let's, uh, let's do a little round robin. Let's talk about how we felt about this book. Mark. Yeah, I, I wouldn't normally read a book like this. Um, eye, eye wrenching, gut opening. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't go for that kind of thing. <laughs> what do you, yes. But um, I don't want my eyes open. But... Um, I I, uh, I really enjoyed this book. I was I was punching the air at certain mm. points as mm. he made made his escape from from civil war. Um, I really enjoyed it. Now, did you did you feel like um, that you were pumping your fist in the air more so than you would be in a fictional rendition of a situation like that? It's a good question. Mm. I don't know. Perhaps, well, perhaps bit. because there's there's a hokiness to the narrative here mm. that you might not forgive mm. if it hadn't happened. To a professional athlete, right, right, Good who then point. writes a book. Yes, yeah, yeah. I I agree. There and there are parts. There are, are lots of things that happen that are very anti-heroic and very human. Mm-hmm. Things like where you're, like, like when he's stuck in the apartment building as the as the uprising is happening and the his apartment building building is taken over by the insurgents and and his neighbor is dying in the hallway and is and the neighbor's daughter is being raped by a insurgent soldier and he can't do anything about it like he's about to go for a go for one of the insurgents guns that had been put down and and try to do something but as soon as he goes for it he's noticed and they basically shove him back into his own apartment at mm-hmm. gunpoint they don't understand each other's language there's nothing i mean he could get himself killed but it's not going to stop it's not going to stop anything from happening. Mm-hmm, and right. it's just a horrible situation that is very unmovie-like. Mm-hmm. I felt like that particular scenario was very unmovie-like. It's like so like anticlimactic and depressing. Like oh, if there's yeah, all this right. stuff he wants to act against. And it's like, oh, oh yeah, you got me at gunpoint. I guess I'm going back inside now and I'm going to cry. Right, right, right. Right, I'm going to shout some expletives at you in a language that you don't understand because I, I feel like maybe you won't kill me, but I need to get this off my chest. Yeah. And then I'm going to go cry in a shadowy room and yeah. eat bugs and worms <laughs> until somebody saves me. Yeah. That's one thing I find really interesting is that um, Alex Awumi is an athlete and, and there's a certain kind of um, language in the sporting world that it's all there's a lot of positive thinking, there's a lot of re- repetition of mantras. And there's a point where he he uses that to carry him through some of the experiences he's going through. But there are things that you can't you can't explain away with, you know, 100. percent We're going to keep keep yeah. giving more than the opposite team. There are things if the you opposite can't team for. have yeah. guns and yeah. they're raping someone, and you're just yeah. going to you, you're going to cry quietly in your apartment. Yeah, you know? and, and your own image you of do. yourself, like your way that you think of yourself, is completely not applicable you can't apply it to this situation right. you'd think mm. maybe you could <clears throat> but instead you're a helpless baby 
in, but, in but, this situation. And yet he keeps, in it, I guess it's uh, to survive and, and to make sense of what's, what he's been through, he, he keeps um, uh, f finding this narrative, this kind of almost redemptive narrative that, that, um, that, that plays against a lot of the reality. Because this isn't a book that really explains to us what, what was going on in Libya. He's very much a naive guy who likes mm. to play basketball, yeah. um, and 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 came out of Libya with not really any more understanding of the place than he went in with. He, he's this confused um, guy trapped in a very strange situation, and and he and he kind of bounces around um, based on the luck and judgment and goodwill of other people in a way that um, it's, it's this kind of almost this kind of picaresque novel it's almost like candide where it's mm -hmm. this guy bouncing around and and the the irony of the the deeper things that are happening to people around him the terrible mm. things that are happening that right. he manages to um avoid um a, there, there are almost two narratives there's there's the one that, that he's writing for himself the personal one mm -hmm. where he's maybe discovered some things about himself by surviving this ordeal right. yeah. and the one that's happening to the world at large yeah like what was actually going on and when he's stuck in the apartment and he doesn't know who these like the soldiers out there what side are they like and what, like, side what is does he it on? Mean? what yeah. side and is the side what, yeah what side is the side what like he doesn't even know what how he is perceived like yeah. what side he would be perceived because he to just be plays on. basketball yeah right. and so i mean he is living in in a Qaddafi family apartment. However, the teams are basically half slaves and abused by the Qaddafis. So right. how do you even know what someone on the other side, someone from the country who doesn't speak your language, right. what they even think about you? Do they think of you as an American? Do they think of you as part of the Gaddafis. Right. Like and, well, why are they why are they not killing him? We'll never find out. And he won't. The sporting world is not one where you can sell out. You the, the mm -hmm. concept of, of morality in sport is so dubious at best. Where you you know, you sign deals with people, you you know, if if you were is there a, a completely altruistic and moral sport that's organized by moral and altruistic people. No, you 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 just play. Yeah. Right. Or maybe in the bush leagues. I mean, in its in its purest state, like when he speaks of falling in love with the sport of basketball in mm -hmm. Nigeria. Oh yeah, it's this beautiful the game thing. itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's uh, and there are these pirated VHS tapes being brought to him from the United States. Absolutely, the glamour of America. Yeah, yeah. 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 Where he, uh, you know, but uh, but I think I mean for that reason because he's sort of outside the moral questions of these struggles yeah. that he's a witness to. He's a great interface for for the reader. Absolutely, I mean, at least for this reader. I mean, Absolutely, hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, as you said, Mark, I you know I, I don't um, I don't really read books like this very often. And um, Kate, I don't know if I mean if if you you know have more of a nonfiction palette in general. I love to read nonfiction, but it's um, usually about subjects that I'm personally engaged with, right? Like, like the arts or yeah. the arts. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yes, and, and this book um, was, uh, you know, uh, recommended to me uh, by Kevin Undergaro. And, uh, and I was leery at first because it's about sports, which I know nothing about. And it's well, you, about... you don't like to talk about your, your college uh -huh. you know uh, scholarships uh, I'm not going to bring that up no. because uh, there's some very painful memories attached to that mm -hmm. I had it all you know like uh, the world in the palm of my hand and yet I blew it because <laughs> I just like bitches and blow too much and, right. uh, the, and the game fell by the wayside but um, be that as it may here I am with this book sports and current events and all these things that I, you know I, I don't know if the average reader like needs such a stripped down um sort of disconnected interface as we get with alex awumi who's just all about the game and mm -hmm. all about his personal struggle and is in the middle of these great you know like I iconic history shifting moments um that he's a sort of witness to witnessing from the you know bombed out gutters and and shattered windows of, of uh you know buildings looking out on these events but um 
you know, uh, maybe the man in the street knows more about what was actually going down in Libya than I do, but I was dreading reading this, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and, uh, but when I finally sat down with it, um, I, was, uh, I was shocked at the uh, literary quality of this memoir. And I'm sure, I'm not sure of Daniel Paisner's uh, background as a, you know, as a ghostwriter or as a facilitator of, uh, of memoirs. But I feel like the raw material mm. of Awumi's struggle, you know, um, was... and clearly a very engaging personality. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I, I completely found him very likable. Oh no, yeah. super charming, yeah. and uh, and you know, and and a kind of abiding selfishness uh, in his view that I also found very engaging because it seemed part and parcel of of you know his character as an athlete absolutely you know and it, very much like an artist of any other kind it seems yeah. exactly the same like right. the artist who escaped from the, from the hitler's threat like mm -hmm. and they weren't involved on any side they just saw some shit going down and they were getting out right. if they could because yeah. they wanted to pursue their pursuits and yeah. you know they went to the american southwest or they went wherever right, right, and like right, right. and and they just got out of there yeah. and and may or may not have had such incredible like uh -huh. incredible gotten into some, some incredible snaggles along right. the way like alex here well, did. Well, and, and even <laughs> i mean apart from the burning cities and the shifting of history i mean just the pure athletic aspect of the memoir it really it like put you know um a, a lot of my art artistic writerly you know uh sniveling in perspective <laughs> because i don't you know like i'll read the biographies of artists who have Kind of you know spotty ebbing and flowing you know periods of, of commitment and passionate obsession with their work you know for the most part um but an athlete doesn't have that luxury you can't do that yeah no, you can't <laughs> he, you know? i mean i i actually found a lot of the the early chapters where he was detailing his high school and college uh -huh. and then uh, uh, playing and um and subsequently his failure to be um drafted in the NBA right found that really compelling yeah. because it's it, what do you do when you're a 17 18 19 year old guy uh -huh. physically very fit and he was he saw a point where he could have had it all right. in his mind right. whether whether he I mean he tells us he was a very he, he was a very good academic student um, he could have gone to possibly to an Ivy League school mm -hmm. um, could have played as a quarterback for a, for a college team could have right. played as a but you know he, he 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 wanted to have it all um, and when there's a point where he ends up, because he tries to hedge his bets so yeah. much, um, yeah. maybe failing. Right. Well, yes. And to remark briefly on, you know, how, you know, how remarkable, I mean, his array of aptitudes was uh -huh. that he was yeah. a, a great basketball player, a great football player. And because of his, you know, father, you know, his parents imposing these, you know, these, these values on him. I mean, he, like, like academic excellence mm -hmm. was not like something he just took it as a given that that was part of the mix. And, yeah. you know, he was like driving himself to be a great man, you know, yeah. but in, you know, in the language of the book, in this, you know, kind of, um, uh, um, slow dribbling kind of sauntering swaggering sort of way but you know if you break down what his actual achievements consisted of I mean this is an incredibly hard-working mm -hmm. driven guy and yeah. he's hard-working and he's driven mm -hmm. and essentially as far as his career goes uh -huh. he's very much a journeyman yeah, yeah. yeah. he's not he's not an NBA star right. yeah he's, right. he, he's, he's a working athlete he's yeah. a working yeah. athlete who has done well to be, a, be paid for what he does. Right. Yeah. Um, but the fact that he ends up in Macedonia, <laughs> in France, yeah. well, um, and back he's... in the States, oh. in the fact that he ends up in Libya at all speaks to right. the fact right. that he hasn't succeeded on the highest level. But it's it's a reminder of um, the, the in sport that there's a whole wave of people you see as mediocre right. who are still exceptional. Yeah. Because of the amount of people that want to succeed in in, in basketball, for example, right. oh, yeah. Huge. Well, in those people that we would consider mediocre, just in comparison to you know the right. people with all the endorsement deals or whatever, are putting more work into it on a daily basis. The, and they're they're a tiny amount below uh -huh. uh, in terms of right. ability. Yeah. A tiny right. amount, yeah. but that tiny amount because that door is, is so huge. Yeah. Yeah.
And, uh, and the fact that for like throughout the various ebbs and flows of his career and the kind of strange impulsive decisions he makes, but like yeah. wherever he ends up, he's recalibrating his strategy. I mean, his, absolutely. His, this, you know, this will get me this for this year, but then next year I'm going to be here. Yeah. Because the goal is, is the NBA. And yeah. so, you know, up until this, you know, catastrophic shattering of the self that happens when he's confronting all this real life horror Absolutely. in libya it's always okay so that seems to knock me back a few steps but if i do this and this and this then i can get into the nba in the nba that way and which is like a 60 year old local actor uh -huh. in a theater production right. saying, you know now now i'm king lear this uh -huh. is this is my now i'm this, this if i do this king lear right. in this local theater production this 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 might be my shot because yeah. It's got some sponsorship and people might come. Right, right, and, right. And, and that, the, the Hollywood dream, the Broadway dream uh -huh. might still be there. Right, right, right. But it's compressed into the first half of a life because athletes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's the, the, the pressure on a teenager. And I mean, that's the thing that really. Yeah. Right, because well, you're like looking for that window yeah. of peak, like physical He's leaving high school and he could yeah. go anywhere. Yeah. Right. He right, could, right. like he said, if he wanted to play football, he would have gone to Texas. If he uh -huh. wanted to play basketball, he could have gone to UCLA. Right. But he tried to do both. Yeah. And <laughs> academia. Yeah. And and that's because when you're a teenager, you don't know what you want to do. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. And you know, and I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that this is at all pertinent, but I just, I, I want to say it. Like, Lar like uh, Lawrence Olivier talked about his uh, King Lear and how he felt like, like, uh, well, King Lear and Romeo to play Romeo. You need to be physically, you know, between like, you know, 15 and 21. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you, to really understand the ironies of that character, you have to be between 30 and 40. Ha. And uh, so, and to. So no one can play it. Well, yeah. And to play King Lear, you, you know, you, like, you need the physical vigor of a, a 17 to 21 year old. Mm -hmm. And um, but you like can't get your head around it mentally until you're actually in your seventies. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so yeah. I think sporting genius uh -huh. often seems to be this um, genius that isn't understood. Like uh -huh. You can be an imbecile, right? And and understand the physics of how a ball moves. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not be able to explain it, you just do it. Right. And and I think sometimes that's where you see. The, the high school college kids who just understand something uh -huh. then they get to a point where they they doubt themselves for the first time and right. they're finished yeah it's done yeah, yeah. So they have to That's think it. in that external yeah. sort of way and it's just you're done yeah. right what's the parable of the ant and the centipede you know and, yeah. yeah how do you move all those legs all at once and then as soon as you think about it <laughs> wait, <you're> <laughs> wait a minute instantly crippled um yeah. But uh, and something I'm I was thankful about in the book as a non sports person, but with this you know like renewed abiding you know admiration for what that that um, that path requires. But the play by play aspect mm -hmm. of a basketball narrative that was really saved like for the last climactic game. Yep. Yep. You know, yeah. it goes there occasionally just so we'll know what everyone's aptitudes reflect about their character and where they are in this pecking mm -hmm. order. But we didn't get a play-by-play -play basketball game with all the terminology and stuff until the, like, you know, climactic game in Alexandria. Yeah. where Which you know, is, by the book, uh -huh. Hollywood ending, yeah. isn't it? And that's, I found that really interesting that he, one of the greatest points in the book is when he, he makes his escape from Libya to mm -hmm. Egypt under such duress. Yeah. He's desperate to get home and his former yeah. coach who has also escaped says, Come and play in Alexandria and he does. Uh -huh. He makes his decision to not go home but to stay for six weeks, two months. Right. Um, without seeing any of his family or his girlfriend. Yeah. And, and he stays to play basketball to get his head right. And then he not only does that but he helps this team sweep to the playoffs right. and win the championship. Right. And win it you know, right at the end of the game, yeah. with a shot right at the end. Um, the um, I loved the um, almost the the predictable um, excitement. You, um, you knew they were going to win, sure. Somehow, mm -hmm. even yeah. though this is nonfiction, yeah. Um, and the way in which somehow that 
coupled with his dad recovering from his illness, it, it, it put this incredible positive gloss on the end mm -hmm. uh, that, that somehow um, in his own sporting world, his yeah. own personal sporting, you know, his, the world in which that's really important to him, which uh -huh. is sporting success, right. he's, he's come out of this experience and he survived and, and everything's great again. Right. But the, there's all these questions to me about... about um, what does it mean when he gets home? What, yeah. What does his What does his girlfriend really think about right, him? Right, right, right. Yeah. Deciding what to play he basketball. Do now? What does it say about him? Yeah. yeah. What does he do now? Yeah. Well, I, um, you and, know, and it, but the, that ending, it, yeah. it, it almost made me feel like the ending of Taxi Driver when, oh. when um, oh, he's a hero. Travis and, Bickle yeah, has just yeah. just killed some people. Right, right. And, uh, and he's getting letters from Jodie Foster's parents, parents saying, "Well then, done, you're a hero." Yeah. And it, it puts this nice spin on something which was actually a blood. But, but it's but it's yeah. bittersweet it's and weird ending. because he's still sitting there. And, and it, I wouldn't really. say this was quite right. quite in that right round, but it, it gave me it made me think of that. Yeah. Because it leads to these questions of right. Well, because his um, I mean, despite that he's laying it all out for us, and this is you know in his voice with other kind of literary controversies uh, or you know conceits, Daniel Paisner is imposing that you know this feels like an authentic transcription of what mm -hmm. he went through and there's um you know he's learning things about himself but there's there's just this this fundamental selfishness mm -hmm. to his character and you know he's he's a religious person and he loves his family and he's respectful of what his family has given him but i i think when you're that committed to when you've like found a verb that seems to define you and mm -hmm. all of your hopes for the future or self-fulfillment or actualization like hinge on your obsessive practice of that verb it like you know <laughs> by necessity you know obviously makes you this you know very kind of myopic person mm -hmm. and i could not after everything that because, I mean, you would think, like, his experiences in Libya and what he witnessed and, you know, all this devastation and all this peril and him, you know, almost beating a man to death and recognizing yeah, this, you know, this, yeah, yeah that, uh, that it would have, like, broken him down to this state. I kept expecting the story to go that way, uh -huh. where he's like, I don't care about basketball anymore. Yeah. But, so, it, it's, like, simultaneously sort of triumphant and exciting and empowering that he, you know, he again, you know, like manages to put his psyche together through the sport that defines him. But at the same time, you, what you're not going back yeah, to your family, there's, your there's father's a denial dying. to the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. into, and I knew after uh, I read this book, I was going to look him up on Wikipedia to see uh -huh. where he is now, because this all happened a couple of years ago. Right, right. And I knew he would still be playing basketball somewhere. Yeah. And he wouldn't be in the NBA, right. and he wouldn't be a big star. He would yeah. be, and right. he is. He's in England. He's yeah. playing in it. Which, uh -huh. which you know, as journeyman leagues go, yeah. there's one for you right there. Sure. Where, you know, it's not a sport over there. Right. And and he's playing, and he's That's being successful, perfect. and yeah. he's winning things right. in a in a small league. And right. then who's to say next year he isn't somewhere else? Yeah. Um, right. I knew that was going to happen. Right. There's something about his ordeal uh -huh. that doesn't change him. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and that and that's um that's weirdly uplifting and in yet way, at the same time sort of like depressing. I agree yeah. with you on the selfishness. Uh -huh. I also I, it doesn't ever put me off him. Right. As a no, it, no. I, I find it yeah. very I I understand it very much. I t I totally do too and I I feel like it's almost what admirable you, actually. It is. Yeah. I I found yeah. it quite admirable and and that he he did really consider the fact that his because he thinks of his family a lot uh -huh. and is in contact with them a lot yeah. and he considers many times what his father always said Absolutely. that if something is good that he would always answer if it is good for you it's good for me right. yeah. and when I mean when it gets to this really intense place where his father is home dying right. and Alex is out making choices about his basketball career but would his father really want him to come home and hover over his deathbed? Oh, or would he true. want him to go kick some ass on the court? Well, yes. I mean, I really felt like... And he'd been hearing that ever since he was growing up. So right. I just... But thought, at the same time, I, a part of me was like, okay, but is that setting up is the big shift in his character? And I, you know... Oh, yeah. And this thing is so, you know, vividly written that, you know, we can, like, speak of him as a literary character with impunity, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. But, like, is... 
the big shift for him to um you know to realize that like him making that the same decision that his father makes mm -hmm. like what's what's okay for my family to, mm -hmm. yeah. you know that 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 would have been like a kind of breakthrough that okay this actually you know my father has sacrificed all this to put me through basketball but me you know like putting that aside and mm -hmm. and hovering over my father's yeah. pointlessly over my father's diabetic coma yeah you know, like you know that like that that kind of sacrifice might mean something another really big thing that kept going on through the book was the influence of other people mm -hmm. so many pretty much every single thing that happened to him it wasn't like even even his sticking you know sticking to basketball and going mm -hmm. to alexandria instead of yeah. going home it's that wasn't yeah. yeah it wasn't because he was laying under the blanket in the you know in the stowaway bus mm -hmm. to get at you know g you know getting getting um get getting out of there it wasn't like he he was had a little blanket and had a revelation and uh -huh. decided to take off no it was because his coach got through to him on the <laughs> yeah, phone yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and right, like right. and talked him <laughs> yeah. into it yeah, and brilliant. he's like it yeah. was the, yeah. vo the voice of god is is a coach yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the coach but, is just saying do you want to play and it's called sharif and i couldn't help it <laughs> but picture omar sharif but not all, <laughs> not only that but all through the book uh -huh. the part of what made the whole story so St like stressful and inter entertaining uh -huh. was because this guy he really was in a position where like especially when he's like when he's trapped in in his apartment in Libya uh -huh. and everyone has abandoned him yeah. and he doesn't speak the language he has no idea what's going on all he knows is that if he tries to leave his apartment he's um, could easily get shot yes. and has actually been threatened at gunpoint and back back into his apartment right. he looks out onto the street there are people getting gunned down on the street yeah. he is just trapped he's like what? trapped for weeks in his apartment with two days worth of food like trying to deal and then, which he gives away yeah yeah, yeah, and yeah. He, but he he ends up the he gets out because of a friend finally getting through to him on the phone mm -hmm. and then because of those kids right. that he had run yeah. into on the he's, way in yeah. Yeah. who what? like who knew the back streets and like they didn't yeah. even speak the he's, language he's relying they, on right. he's relying on people all the way what? through and it often people who don't even speak the language right. and it yeah. makes it just like oh, he doesn't actually know what like they could he knows even these kids they could be taking him on a wild goose chase to get killed or right. something yeah, yeah, yeah. he knows right. this that it's a great detail the kids that he sees every day kicking um, kicking the ball around in the yeah. street right. and then suddenly carrying machetes and and, and yeah guns. well and now now what what does that mean yeah and, and they l luckily they they know him they recognize him and well, they help I, him but yeah luckily they just... like him regardless right. of whatever it means well, because he's like a hero to them yeah. and they don't have a vested interest like a coach does in his athletic development yeah and I, I like that's a that is like this incredible bleak crossroads moments because there are no coaches and there have been all these that's it there's no one there's, there's no the one yeah and so but like who was he left with in that room he's like talking to childhood versions of himself in a mirror Absolutely. yeah and he's like like the calls from the coach might like you know like mobilize him to make a more decisive like you know leap to save his life but what's actually keeping him alive in that room is him keeping the counsel of his more innocent selves and i felt like those children were like a reflection of that like the mm -hmm. coaches are going to help you move forward and make decisions but like the child that you were and these kids yeah. who just think they're awesome yeah. who are you know like who know your stats but oh you're you're just you're right. a hero because a coach is 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 the most important guy until he's not your coach anymore yeah 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 and the you know and, and there are several of those 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 men in the the story right and yeah. they know all about what you need to do to improve your game but the like childhood self that found joy in meaning on the court yeah. and in the joy of the game that's what's going to keep you alive yeah and that you know and that's like the most important i thing. really yeah. um his his lack of understanding of what's going on in benghazi when the violence begins really adds to the the, the fear factor and, yeah. the, and, and and in a way if it was a journalist telling us that story who right. could give more context right it might be less scary or it might be more scary but uh -huh. because the context is is chilling but yeah it would certainly be different yeah. it would be different <laughs> yeah and his his he looks out the window he sees people being shot by by um the army he doesn't know 
he has no idea what's going on. He and, and the way in which he manages to survive those details of, you know, drinking the toilet water, uh-huh. uh, drinking the the rainwater in the in the plant pots outside, right. um, um, and then the toilet leaking and him uh. just pushing right. the duvet against the yeah. into the hallway against right, the right, bathroom right. door just yes. to just soak up the the Is mess it? that's coming through. Right. And the moment where he th- he wakes up with that. Uh, the sewage on his face, and he thinks the water's back on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, all yeah. those details are uh, so brilliantly right, right. captured. Uh, it's really visceral. Yeah. Um, how skinny he's getting. What do you do? You know, eating yeah. the bugs. The moment where he right. gets the cockroaches, yeah. yeah, and then he squashes one, eats it, and it's disgusting. Oh, so and he remembers that's not you don't, way to eat a cockroach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he I remembers that girls. one detail. On a reality TV, <laughs> you don't, you don't oh, squish. Yeah, yeah, you don't squish it. Put them straight down yeah. while yeah. they're alive. Right, right. Um, well, and uh, I mean, those children were were amazing, and the fact that he doesn't like know that they're not going to leave. The, and the fact that you're not, you're not. I wasn't that worried about the kids. Uh-huh. You know, they're living in this horrific situation, right. this civil war essentially. But yeah. But the kids just seem, they're so streetwise. Yeah. It yeah. seems like they're not the ones who are worried about. Worried about right. this big six foot five guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Wearing Nikes. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and that, yes. And, and he's the, been threatened by children in well, other parts have, of the no, book, and too. And that's one of my favorite parts of the book is, <laughs> yeah. is, is like these, you know, children that help him are mirrored by the... You the know, Macedonian kids. The Macedonian, yeah, yeah little monsters, a little, a little baby child yeah. with an eye patch holding a smaller baby. Yeah. Put money, money. Yeah, they're tra- threatening him and trying. They're trying to scam him and they're yeah. threatening him. Yeah. And he's scared. Absolutely, right? absolutely scared. You, how do you fight those kids? Yeah, yeah. How do you fight those kids. Yeah, uh, chasing them through the streets because yeah, it's a giant mass of little tiny evil babies. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so yeah, what a uh, what a crazy journey. He, uh, he went some through. great images yeah. when he's in the he's at the border trying to get into Egypt right. in the detention center waiting uh-huh. and he's scavenging in the trash right for any bits of food and he sees uh, a, a girl look at him right. and he sees himself as this track suit. tall guy yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. track suit with his nice shiny Nike like expensive uh-huh. athletic gear but, right, like but a mess yeah. Great yeah. Image. it's a great image yeah, yeah it totally is and he's trying to be polite all the time too and he's a complete <laughs> putrid mess but uh-huh. wearing like expensive athletic gear and clearly in, you know really tall and right, like right. but just like shriveled and stinking and like it's just and, crazy yeah. yeah he's only he's only ever done one thing really which is train and practice yeah. you know, we can't do that what do you do right. you know the, his downtime says something about him uh, he'll try and Skype with his family yeah. or, and he prays a lot <clears throat> yeah oh, or right. he'll watch Rush Hour 3 again yeah. Yeah, again yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, just, I just love that movie Beverly now. Hills Cop <laughs> <laughs> and, and you uh-huh. know there's a point where you can get where everything is so noisy and messy when uh-huh. you, you just need to watch a film like that right. mm-hmm. it's the only way yeah, well, and I I love the bit where he's um, he's suggesting that him and his family could be that they're like a Skype poster family, yeah. and that and yeah. he's marveling at just how cool the modern world is, despite despite yeah. the fact that you know very shortly there after the modern world is exploding outside his mm-hmm. window that he's he's just loving that he lives in this moment of time where <laughs> um, you know and yeah I mean like could a story like his exist in any other age i mean never mind the right. you know the, the like the revolutionary parts but you know that he was he's a, a nigerian prince mm-hmm. yeah basically and who moved to boston yeah and <laughs> um yeah, yeah that's uh and that and that like what a prince means like you were saying yeah it was so interesting just to learn some things about what it was like to be a certain kind of person in nigeria and what wealth means in nigeria and what royalty is in nigeria uh-huh. The idea that he that his father was one of sixty seven children, right. mm-hmm. sixty seven children, I, he, which he first is apologizing that he doesn't exactly know how many cousins he has in the village, uh-huh. and then he has to back up and say, "Well, there are a lot because my father was one of sixty seven children, and and proceeded to have twenty seven wives." And so I don't know how many like brothers and sisters, or yeah, this that Alex has, right. but that's but that's what. That's what a wealthy person does in Nigeria. Right. We don't wealthy people just don't really. That's not really what we <laughs> and, do and here. They, and they, I didn't know that. Like right. I'm so ignorant of other cultures, and 
this is such a personal story that really has nothing to do with life in Nigeria, political conflict, uh -huh. you know, what's going on with anything. It's not even about sports, really. Mm -hmm. right. It's just about this guy and the crazy like life that he hap that kind of happened to him right. and it but it's but all the all of the situations are so so interesting and so nothing I, yeah. i've yeah. never known yeah. anything about this stuff right. from international basketball to life as a wealthy person in nigeria again with the education who knew that the education situation was so high powered that it wasn't unusual i guess a very high focus on math and science and it was mm -hmm. not unusual for these young nigerians to be going off to american colleges at 15 or 16 mm -hmm. yeah. having excelled and right. i just don't know anything about nigeria and yeah. it was fascinating well and and uh and the in terms of like world events swirling around these personal stories i love the love story aspect yeah. and that uh alex meets alexis who's you know uh who he could only meet someone with his almost his own name <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and so, i don't mean, I don't so, mean that cruelly yeah. it, it, it's but it, it is focus let's say this is my focus he must yeah, be yeah. awesome yeah <laughs> Um, and that, uh, but she sounds perfect. Well, yes, yeah. and this, uh, but this beautiful girl that, uh, you know, her background is New Orleans, and mm -hmm. you know, and just her yeah. whole history has been devastated by by Katrina, and the after effects of Katrina, and I mean, his his history has been turbulent up up until this point, but it just it reaches this sort of orchestral literary correctness when <laughs> like we don't there isn't much follow-up he's going home to her and he's had this triumph and he's been through all this stuff but you feel like she's like the you know like the only woman you can imagine that could you know that will be actually like thankful you know for the opportunity to help him work through this mm -hmm. stuff and that has all this actual carnage and horror in her own background yeah. And has managed to find, like, sweetness who can present herself as a sweet, mm -hmm. you know, like, loving person, despite all the horror in her background. And uh, I just know that they're, they're going to be great together. <laughs> I mean, if I get on Wikipedia after this and find that they broke up, <laughs> I'm going to do something drastic. Yeah. 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 Um, but, uh, they're Skyping right now. Right, yeah. yeah. They're Skyping as we speak. And um, there must be an endorsement deal. I know there's there's movie buzz around this book. And yeah. No doubt there'll be a huge Skype endorsement. Um, but uh, uh, something else, speaking of the Alex thing, the fact that he goes to Macedonia, hometown uh -huh. of Alexander the Great, yeah. the Great. <laughs> and is hailed. And, uh, and I love the story, the book kind of lightly, you know, I mean, okay, he's a, he's a sports hero, a kind of, you know, minor sports hero in his way, but the fact that athletes have this mantle of heroism placed upon them mm -hmm. and and the the book kind of you know like touches on these kind of like different models of heroism like we speak of alexander the great you know this great you know he, he built you know the greatest um empire that had, the world had thus far seen and Gaddafi is this you know like heroic figure mm -hmm. until everything starts to go to hell Heroic figure from a distance, as long as you just care about basketball, you're not really asking. Yeah, yeah, that was a questions. really interesting thing too yeah. about uh -huh. like what. Growing up in Nigeria, he uh -huh. saw Gaddafi. And yeah, it was Gaddafi was a, a benevolent. So, yeah. um, talking about heroism. Yes. There's a point at which I mean, one thing that's interesting to me in this book is the glamour of America. Yes. Um, as a as a child, becoming obsessed with basketball, the NBA is uh -huh. where it's at, yeah. and it is. Right. Yeah. And so he becomes obsessed with these figures that he can see on VHS. And so to uh -huh. finally move to America is uh -huh. a great moment in his, in his young life. Right. But also, then when he travels abroad, it's very much as an American. Yeah. You know, he's very much in Libya as an American because right. he's playing basketball. Right. It's not as a Nigerian. Right. I mean, the, the, it, and I wonder, it's almost like, um, because I don't know much about basketball, and I don't know Alex, and I don't know how good he actually is. I can only take his word that he was close enough to the NBA draft to be excited on draft day. I can only right. know uh, from what he tells me how how good he is. Yeah. Um, and uh, but but he arrives in these different countries as an American. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a tall, athletic American. Right. Uh, it's almost like. Um, 
I imagine jazz musicians. Uh -huh. You could be American and you could go to if you can and you can be an African American and go to uh -huh. Paris. Yeah. And people will give you um a certain credibility. Right. Because you're you you're America created this. Right, right. This right. is an American thing. Yeah. And you, you have an authenticity. I wonder how much of that comes with uh you know, there are Americans all over the planet right. playing basketball. Right. Yeah. yeah. And and it's similar to um I, it always strikes me as interesting when you see reports from any event anywhere around the world. Mm. Um, you can go to the smallest village in Bangladesh where there's floods, go mm. to the Sudan where there are people um, starving, and you will see a Yankees cap, or you'll see yeah. you'll see a Manchester United right. jersey. You'll right. see something from the Western world. You'll see an ACDC t-shirt. You uh -huh. know, you'll see yeah. this yeah. Um, the the power of of Western culture uh -huh. on the rest of the world is really interesting. And I mean, and that's why he plays basketball. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's uh, why I, he started playing. Yes. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, I think that, you know, that's, that's what started him playing and, you know, and his goals are definitely in that, you know, like that sort of diadem of, you know, of, of Dennis Rodman, magic mm -hmm. Johnsonism. Um, but what I like in terms of his education and his journey leading up, to Libya is that sort of detour he takes into that rural, deeply religious um, yeah. college. Yeah, I mean, looking back, his his career choices uh -huh. it could be er erratic, but right. his logic is sound. Yeah, well, yeah, and like <laughs> him not even knowing that he needed that, but what that felt like and the way he describes that experience, the constant prayer and the orientation mm -hmm. of his athletic self towards this like meditative saintly state absolutely you yeah. know like I, like that those passages to me like you know i could i could connect that to whatever i've you know experienced mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. as a writer what i think anyone can experience in whatever like form seems to like make their whole life mean something and uh and the, and you know and he almost never go i mean he prays a lot after the fact but he never kind of like goes to that place. He's still worried about his career. Then he's worried about surviving and then mm -hmm. career issues again. But having that in the book, this experience he had where after all the striving and the hustling and, oh, and I blew this and, you know, and oh, <laughs> but I can't believe you took this away from me for a stupid reason and what the hell and my report card and, uh -huh. you know, and just all this sort of like scrabbling and shucking and jiving, I felt like. It was almost this, like you know, religious reorientation towards like the, the spiritual power of basketball. Absolutely, you know, yeah. what's happening in that place. Yeah, beyond his career, yeah. just to play. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. And not even just for the, not for, not even, this. I mean, you, you see it. You see how it's like not even just for the player, and not even just for the players and for the game, but uh -huh. for the people, like. There's just this thing, like in the middle of political unrest and everything, like yeah. in the middle of these crazy situations. Huh. It's uh -huh. like, I'm not one of these people who are into sports. I'm just like, what? But yeah. but you can see that for so many people, it's this thing that's like, like the best thing and like a saving grace and like joy in their lives. Right, right, like, right, right. Absolutely. So well, interesting. Yeah. Well, it's someone, I mean, for like the spectator, it's something where you can invest your faith and identity in one side or the other mm -hmm. or one player over another player and it's a way for like the like struggles to get resolved in a way there, where there isn't a body count and you know that isn't uncomplicated that is uncomplicated by politics and you can see the kind of like weird almost perverse appeal that 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 might have for actual for Qaddafi's Absolutely. and for yeah. Idi Amin's or you know or, well and then the flip side know, of that is uh, there's there's an authenticity to owning a sporting team yeah uh, there's a yeah. there's um th there's a ceremony right. involved that doesn't involve right killing people or or, or political maneuvering necessarily on the field right or on the or on the court it it all makes sense yeah and and you can sit in the crowd and you can wave like Caesar. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's um, a hell of a Sabbath. But that, thing. that's <laughs> what, like the the Macedonia chapter is great because oh. because of the, I mean the the tensions in that part of the world, um, ethnically, uh -huh. politically, religiously, right. are, are completely alien to Alex. Yeah. And the fact that he's got Albanians on his team. Yeah. Who and he lives in the Albanian quarter. It only dawns on him as they're playing a game where. People are throwing bottles at them. People are burning the Albanian flag. Oh, yeah. Oh, right, right, right. 
um, it, yeah, people people can in in a time of relative peace use these sporting occasions, and so many so many um, sporting clubs are, and the, people don't just necessarily start uh, a, a sporting. Um, it, there there have been so many. Um, um, I mean, I think about in the UK when um, so many soccer teams came from the church or uh -huh. from from this idea of we have to keep our boys active so they don't touch themselves. Uh -huh. There's this kind of evangelical zeal to them. Mm -hmm. right. And so many teams which, I mean, you can look through the history of of sport, and especially in Europe, where, oh, these guys were the fascist team. Right. These, guy were, these guys were the army team. These right. guys were the police. These uh -huh. guys were the rebels. And, and, and people hold on to those identities. They matter right. in a way that um, when you're an athlete, you want to play. Yeah. I'll play for these guys. Yeah. Um, who are you playing for? Right. You know, are right. you playing for the fascists? Are you playing for the communists? Yeah. Are you playing for the, the Muslims, the Christians? Right. You don't necessarily care. Right. You want to yeah. play. Like, these seem like good guys. I'll play. Yeah. yeah. And you maybe know somebody, oh, know, know somebody right. who's on the team. Yeah. They're no, I'm in no an apartment worthy. and they're paying me all this money. And right. oh, wait, but what does it mean? Yeah. And the, he, his... I, his his naivety and innocence when it comes to this is also, really compelling. So yes. fabulous, like it. I mean, at least within all the content of the book, he never even seems to wonder or ask no. the question or look back no. and say, yeah, "Should I have gone here or, for, for like moral reasons rather yeah. than for, for, because my family were worried about me? Yeah. Right. Should I have taken this money? Should I have investigated further?" He doesn't ask that. He question doesn't even go. Right. So hey, Coach Sharif, or hey, yeah. who are we? Hey, Mustafa. What was going on there anyway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, are we the it's bad never guys? even brought up. <laughs> right. Like, who, who's who here, and what was that about? He never even asks it, as far as we know. Those um, those moments in the apartment in Benghazi, and later in um, that cell that he's locked in when he's trying to uh, get out of the country. Oh yeah, where he again has to establish contact with. His um, his sloughed former selves mm -hmm. to uh, maintain any kind of sanity. I mean, those are beautiful moments that mm -hmm. you wouldn't yeah. expect to find in a sports memoir. Of Absolutely, any kind. yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and uh, but there's also something about his great strength of character. What at times seems like shallowness or selfishness, as we've said, it makes me feel like someone more introspective or someone who interrogates themselves more might be totally destroyed for life by these experiences absolutely <laughs> absolutely whereas he he has a series yeah. of mantras that he falls back on yeah he must yeah. practice harder yeah must yeah. get in yes. shape it's like, love my family love god boom 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 right. uh, that that um can seem like he's in denial and yet yeah just keeps pushing him on it's a way of keep, and, he can keep his that's why i think we find it kind of admirable is because somehow this this combination of ways that he deals with situations, the way that he thinks, they all enable him to maintain his focus. Right. And then maintaining his focus keeps him on keeps him on his game and keeps him doing what he loves. Right. And we all want to be doing that, you know? Yeah. And here here's this 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 funny dude. Right. And he's mm. he's found found a way to stay focused, which is funny. It's different. Like the difference between be, the difference between being introspective uh -huh. and being focused, right. the difference between being selfish and focused, like, I feel like he's actually not that selfish, but he's so focused that he does things that you would maybe consider selfish. Right. But I think it's a focus that he has, right. partly just... Well, you know, I mean, I mean, not not to be, uh, you know, too much of a suck ass in this context, uh, in this context, but go on. Uh, oh, Can't what wait. the hell? Who's asking you to suck? What's Come it going to be? Well, um, you know, uh, 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 Kevin Undergaro, who you know, who uh, with uh, Maria Menounos runs the whole After Buzz Enterprise and by extension Book Circle Online. He, you know, over the years, I mean, I first met him when he was a substitute teacher of mine in high school. And really? uh, yeah, and so he's. Did you uh, give him a hard time then? Um, n not in any way that he didn't like. I don't think, and you know, hence our enduring relationship. But he's. Oh, uh, that's dirty. He's. Uh, he's certainly. You know, he's had a. a you know. Uh, you know, he's been a mentor to me over the years. A coach, to, even. A coach, even. You know, and to varying degrees, based on how much I was willing to listen. 
you know, um, and and you know, be a team player. Jason. Well, yeah, I, you know, sometimes, you know, but sometimes, <laughs> you know, I, you know, maybe not looked out for myself as much as I should. Um, but he. It's the uh, same thing. It's the same thing, right? <laughs> ah, it's the biota. Mm -hmm. Further the interest of the biota mm -hmm. through individual achievement. But Coach Sharif, right? Coach Sharif, go. Um, but uh, so uh, Kevin, you know, like is not a super sportsy guy, but he knows about sports and has often used sports analogies in trying to. They're very effective. Well, they, yes, they. Uh, you know, they they can be, and I, uh, you know, bec and and sometimes. They'll get involved and specific, and they'll kind of baffle me. And uh, oh, okay, I guess I get that. And then I'll like want to like watch some of the game he's referring to, so I'll you know know what he, exactly he's getting at. But um, but I kept thinking of that relationship, and you know, and and bits of wisdom that have been that he's imparted to me whilst listening to Alex's you know relationships with his coaches, and um, and the fact that you know like the fundamental you know the kind of life shaping influence that a sport can have mm -hmm. or that seems to have is that you're going to have all sorts of personal problems you're going to have all you're going to be tugged in all these mm -hmm. different directions but you know where the court is yeah you know, and, and like, you know who's winning. And you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, and even if it's just, even if it's before, like the numbers are up, and it's just you and that basket. Yeah. I mean, that moment when Alex is washing his hands and his coach <laughs> walks up, and he thinks he's awesome, and uh, and it, it's a bit of theater, but the coach is pretending to wash his hands just so he can wait for that moment where their eyes can meet in the mirror. You need to practice hard. And that it's not a judgment. I nodded at that. Yeah, he's right. I do. Right. No. Totally. I, do. I felt it, and it, you know, and <laughs> mm -hmm. I, and that coach looked like Kevin to me. And that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Chief. <laughs> but also, they're telling yeah. you that it's worth it. Yeah. That you're good enough. Right. You. Yeah. Should practice harder, because, not yeah. you should find a plan B. Right, it's right, like right, right. you yeah, 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 yeah. you need to apply right. yourself. It's worth it. Right. That's not, what... not we've all made a terrible mistake. Yeah. Really... <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Hi, Kevin. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so I yeah, so that I mean, this is um, yeah, this this uh, this Alex's journey has brought me closer to Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all feel uh, closer to I Kevin. Think, I think now. we all do. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Anyway, Thanks, we're going to cut all of this out. Anyway, <laughs> um, it's fun to perform, though, knowing that you can it just is. go to have for a specific it. listener. I know. What the hell? So, um, um, can yes. I say something weird? Oh, I've please. Read, I've been reading um, Empire of the Sun, J.G. Barrett. Really? He, it's five years since his death. Yeah. Um, and I've been reading that. Oh. I, I, was, I read the first. 50 pages, stopped to read um, this book. Okay. Um, I've gone back to um, Empire of the Sun. It's the same story. Really? Yeah. Really? It's the same story. In Empire of the Sun, the young Jim, uh -huh. loosely based on J.G. Ballard himself, yeah, right. he's in Shanghai, the Japanese invade. He spends time in different apartments looking for food, right. hi hiding out from soldiers right. outside, not knowing what's no going shit. on. He right. ends up trying to escape. He ends up in a, in a camp waiting to hopefully move somewhere right. else to another right. camp it's the same story right wow wow this happens to me all the time uh -huh. i read a book i read another book it's the same book right. i read one book it's the same book over and over interesting well those are a crazy question. combination well, though. yeah <laughs> I know. but well but completely I... different because and yet, this is not annihilation no. Right. No, no, <laughs> true no. enough, true enough. But, but, but that's some, amazing. I haven't read Empire of the Sun. I don't but, even know what it's right. about. But something, no well, but, you know, but something presenting itself as a memoir, I mean, there's, you know, some yes. structure of verisimilitude, mm -hmm. but all, but the body of the memoir is a quasi sophisticated person, mm -hmm. but still childlike, yeah. you know, who doesn't know it and like trapped in circumstances. A lot, a lot of the joy in Empire of the Sun comes from realizing that the young Jim doesn't quite understand his situation. As right. streetwise as he is, yeah. he doesn't quite realize 
really how dangerous it is. Well, yeah, it how, is. yeah. How dangerous like the, the Japanese are to me. Absolutely. And it's, you're only and it's like Alex, with, in a way. You, yeah, right. you, right. you don't have any macro view. Right. It's right. like you're right. only And like, who does, ultimately? Yeah. 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 Well, People have a, an illusion that they do, I guess. Right. Yeah. Well, we all or, we think we know it all. Yeah. Well, yeah, but, <laughs> well, but so then, I, the thing, well, I, you know, um, but like that those characters get to experience this terror, maybe we don't get all the finer points and the details and the ramifications, but they don't have any of the bigotries mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. preconceived notions and assessments that would make this a piece of journalism. Absolutely. We get the poetry. And I, I, I think, I mean, certainly Empire of the Sun is a poetic document, but Gaddafi's point guard is running riot with, uh, with poetical moments. I, uh, I, yeah. I was yeah. surprised by its poetry yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised and, and it's the imagery it's it's lying under the the blanket on the back of the bus right. with another um, oversized <laughs> uh -huh. uh, guy yeah. uh -huh. trying to escape yeah uh, it's 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 yeah wearing the the, uh, the the kind of dirty now dirty but previously immaculate yeah. sportswear yeah. in a camp where you're trying to escape to right. Egypt. Yeah. And whenever, and Countries he doesn't know. He doesn't we, even know. couldn't put them up, point them out on a map. And right. he's under the second blanket in the back of the second bus and it's being searched by, by, the, oh, yeah. by the soldiers or the police or whatever. And he, he sees the boots of the, yes, right, the right, right. And soldier walking up. And the people up. on the bus are protecting him. Yeah. Yeah. And he doesn't know. He doesn't. There's the language thing. He doesn't know. Right. He doesn't know why they're helping him. Yeah, he doesn't know why they're helping and him. He still doesn't. But he yeah. still doesn't. Yeah. But all the people on the bus, like, they acted for the right. soldier right. and totally sold it. That right. no, we're cool. Like, yeah, you know, we're just like, Egyptians on yeah, this bus. Yeah, we're like, on this bus. And, we're and all that's Egyptians. Where, uh, like, what the hell? All the Egyptians were helping smuggle completely. him. And right. that's when he, he has to resort to this cliched language about them being angels. Because what right. else can you say? Yeah. In the face right, of that? Right. You have yeah, to come they don't even this... know you. Yeah. Right. Like, well, and, and that's why. And they risk their lives. Yeah. Like, for reasons that you have no idea why. Right. I mean, right. And to experience these earth-shattering events through the eyes of someone without those bigotries or preconceived notions who can experience things that way, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it, it's amazing. I mean, we get this human element and the fact that there, there will always be those figures who have a vested interest, who are lobbing the bombs or directing the lobbing of the bombs or who are mounting the guns and the SUVs or who are on... You know, you know, on on television, you know, spouting the manifestos, and uh, there are those people, and, and there's everybody, and else. then there's everybody else yeah. who's just yeah. trying to fucking survive this shit. That yeah. all these people who really believe in things, because you most know, people yeah. like just want to say, just leave me alone. Yes, yeah. just leave. Just <laughs> yeah. let me do my thing. That's what most of it. And, and uh, in some ways, there's uh, a guilt attached to that because uh, by saying that, you're complicit somehow. Right, but um, yeah, by not, that's like, complicated. Well, yeah, it's like by not being a political activist yeah, that right. now you're like an enabler. By not saying of, no, yeah. you're saying yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, because but it's not. I I feel like you know the kind of humanity that we encounter in in these situations and in these narratives. It's not like leave me alone. I just want to build a fence and get away from you people. No. It's like leave me alone and just stop hurting people. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah absolutely. Yeah, stop. And hurting that's why people. to judge Alex for any of his decisions in his career. It, yeah, it's to judge yourself, really. Right. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, what you know, he's a guy just trying to play the game. Right. Yeah. And to pass judgment on him is say, okay, so the alternative is to, to, to be like someone who's really, you know, committed to some political idea or something. But that's the guy with the gun on top of the SUV. Right. Right. I mean, he really believes in what he's yeah. doing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm, you know, right. stone cold, but I would be more likely to cap like to castigate the mother for saying that him not coming home was going to kill the father when the uh -huh. father would never have said that thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the mother freaking out. And, you know, right. obviously she's in an, in an incredibly hard, hard to deal with situation. Right. But she's she's throw, she's lobbing that at yeah. him against his life, against his career, and also against what his father always taught him. Right. Well, okay, but that's well, and maybe, also but see, maybe I'm a hard boiled bitch. No, I don't, know. I don't think. No, no I, I think these are all complicated people because yeah. also Coach Sharif. I really think Alex needs to work through this stuff. He <laughs> wants Alex on his basketball yeah. team, mm -hmm. but that other stuff is true. 
you know yeah. I mean, yeah. he, you know you can he makes a case yeah, yeah. i mean and, yeah. and i think it really turned out to be true uh -huh. and it's true that he wasn't doing it well, just you think for... so because you've read alex's book right. exactly yeah yeah. And, and because Alex read, really came around to If you read Alexis's book, I'm <laughs> waiting for Alex to come home. <laughs> yeah. You might not agree. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, and except, for, yeah. except, for that, except for that I'm an artist and I admire artists who, like, who do shut out everything else and follow yeah. their thing. Oh. So yeah, I his, don't know that I never... His reasons seem to be innocent. And so you could, that's why... It's fine for him. Or at happen. least if he's guilty, he's guilty of something that I also agree with. Yeah, totally so like yeah. so I would be more likely to identify with, with Alex than with all of his suffering family crying and renting their garments <laughs> and waiting at home for him to please <laughs> come home, Alex. <laughs> I mean yeah. he's up there like having an adventure and living his life and going as far as he can. Go Alex. Go Alex. <laughs> Eat those roaches. <laughs> um yeah. All right. Well, uh, okay. This has been um, a lively dissection. Do we have any uh, closing arguments aside from our cheering on of the uh, of Alex's single-minded, um, selfish? I really love the idea of um, having some comparative analysis of dual dual. Um, literary works. Yeah. Oh, wouldn't yeah. that be That's fun to have? Idea. I could do like, it every week. Right. Yeah. yeah, it seems like these things just echo. Right. Yeah, and I think you, when you're saturated in something, it just it's everywhere. Right. Because yeah, I totally like. I can't think of a good example right now, but exactly what you described happens to me all the time. Yeah. And I love to go over it and over it. And I mean, you know, we can have book polygon. Right. True enough. Mm. <laughs> well, okay, and and what, what, what and we'll have to parallelogram online. Right. Well, yes. No, I love that idea. We'll have to pick and choose and be studious about it because I'm uh, at around the same time. I've been reading Gaddafi's point guard. I've been reading uh, the massive new um, William Burroughs biography by Barry Miles. And they're the same guy. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm uh, saying. North Africa? It doesn't always work. North Africa? I'm not there yet. The drug trade? Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, um, but yeah, uh, I mean, you could bend over backwards and wedge it in sideways, <laughs> but really almost antithetical. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Talking yeah. about antithesis is okay, too. Uh, yeah, it's no, It's interesting. Sure enough, sure like, I feel like it's kind yeah. of, I mean, as if we don't have enough to read already. Yeah, right. Here I am, a glutton for punishment. <laughs> yeah, look at this. See? So many books. That's I, what love, I love being doing a champion this. is all about being a glutton for punishment. Um, I guess so. Thank you, Alex, for teaching us that. Yes. Anyway, uh, so uh, so here we are. We've been um, uh, picking Gaddafi's point guard to lovely... Uh, Pick and roll. Dribbling peaches. Yes, <laughs> dribble, dribble. And... Uh, <laughs> Yes, it's been great. We love this book, and we love Gaddafi. No, we don't. We love Alex Away. Wait, we love Alex. <laughs> and uh, and we love um, Alexis, his uh, his ravishing consort. Absolutely. Yeah, she's and, really pretty. Uh, yes, I hope he develops a competing memoir, or you know, um, perhaps um, a video. Yes. Um, and uh, it's been lovely. I'm Jason Squamata for Book Circle Online. And uh, just uh, reminding you that if you dig these Book Circle podcasts, um, whatever vector you're receiving them through, check them out on iTunes. Download them through iTunes. Why, and why should we do that? Jason? Because then you can leave comments, okay, yep. that makes us more popular and more powerful and more enabled to do more expansive, extensive, and engaging podcasts in this book circle mode and we can start a conversation you leave comments yep. on itunes and we're, we're gonna we're gonna come at you we're gonna talk about them and we want to accumulate an army of book circle super fans you feed it and it yeah, grows so. yeah precisely mm -hmm. okay like with anything yeah. i'm gonna assume alternate identities yeah i'm gonna come that's fine. Don't you, you want to see Kate Fenker in various? Um, I'm going to troll myself. Identity. She's trolling herself as we <laughs> like, speak. Like, like if you want to see fights. video of, of, of Kate Fenker trolling herself, you mean Cat Cat Fonker? Cat Fonker, if you will, as they say on the Kit, rape bar. Kate Fenker. Kate Fenker. Yes, waiting in a window, uh, in a virtual window on your internet rape bar. Cat Fenker for Book Circle Online. Um, yes, the possibilities are endless, but let's get this rolling, people. iTunes, YouTube, BookCircleOnline.com, but yeah, hit that iTunes up and let's see what happens. Let's start a conversation. That's mm -hmm. all I'm saying. Yes. 
Um, I'm Jason Squamata. I'm Mark Savage. I'm Kat Funka. Kat Funka, <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> we are beaming live from the libraries of Maria Menounos, and we have been talking about Gaddafi's point guard. Keep it bookish, keep it circular, keep reading alive. Ink blots turning into dreams in your mind as you read them. That's real. That's what a book is. Go read some books. Thank you. From managing editor Jason Squamata, executive producers Maria Menounos, Phil Svitek, and Kevin Undergaro, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Book Circle Online. For more discussion, go to bookcircleonline.com. And if you have comments, questions, or book title suggestions, write us at info at bookcircleonline.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this is Book Circle Online. BCO, join the circle. A few moments later, I pinched another rote from the cup and popped it in my mouth, trying super hard not to think about what I was doing. And you have to understand, these were big-ass African-type cockroaches. They looked like giant water bugs. But I just chomped down hard and bit into this sucker. This second one, the live one, tasted kind of salty. I could feel it squirming around in there for just a beat, and then when I bit down on it, all I could think was that it was salty and gross. But I kept it down. I had to fight it, but I kept it down. And I'll be damned. I started to feel like I had a little more energy. So I ate a couple more. Ate a couple of worms, too. So that's how I got by the rest of the way, eating bugs and worms from the flower pots outside my window, switching from toilet tea to dirty rainwater tea, doing whatever I had to do to survive. That was an excerpt from Gaddafi's Point Guard, the incredible story of a professional basketball player trapped in Libya's civil war by Alex Awumi with Daniel Paisner. I'm Jason Squamata. This is the Gaddafi's Point Guard edition of Book Circle Online. From the library of Maria Menounos, this is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now... Book Circle Online. I am Jason Squamata uh, for Book Circle Online. I am here with my ravishing co hosts, Mark Savage, Kate Banker. And uh, let's, uh, let's do a little round robin. Let's talk about how we felt about this book, Mark. Yeah, I, I wouldn't normally read a book like this. Um, eye, eye wrenching, gut opening. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't go for that kind of thing. <laughs> What do you, yes, but um, I don't want my eyes open. But um, I I uh, I really enjoyed this book. I was I was punching the air at certain mm. points as mm. he made made his escape from from civil war. Um, I really enjoyed it. Now, did you did you feel like um, that you were pumping your fist in the air more so than you would be in a fictional rendition of a situation like that? It's a good question. Mm. I don't know. Perhaps. Well, perhaps. Bit. Because there's, there's a hokiness to the narrative here mm. that you might not forgive mm. if it hadn't happened to a professional athlete. Right. Right. Good then point. It's a book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. There And there are parts, there are, are lots of things that happen that are very anti-heroic and very human. Mm -hmm. Things like where you're, like, like when he's stuck in the apartment building as the, as the uprising is happening and the his apartment building building is taken over by the insurgents and, and his neighbor is dying in the hallway and is and the neighbor's daughter is being raped by a insurgent soldier, and he can't do anything about it. Like he's about to go for a go for one of the insurgents' guns that had been put down and. And try to do something, but as soon as he goes for it, he's noticed, and they basically shove him back into his own apartment at mm -hmm. gunpoint. They don't understand each other's language. There's nothing, I mean, he could get himself killed, but it's not going to stop 
It's not going to stop anything from happening. Mm -hmm. And it's just a horrible situation that is very Mm unmovie-like. I felt like that particular scenario was very unmovie-like. It's, like, so, like, anticlimactic and depressing. Like, Uh there's all this stuff he wants to act against, and it's like, oh, oh, yeah, you got me at gunpoint. I guess I'm going back inside now, and I'm going to cry. Right, right, right. Right, I'm going to shout some expletives at you in a language that you don't understand because I, I feel like maybe you won't kill me, but I need to get this off my chest. Yeah. And then I'm going to go cry in a shadowy room and yeah. eat bugs and worms <laughs> until somebody saves me. Yeah. That's one thing I find really interesting is that um, Alex Awumi is an athlete, and there's a certain kind of um, language in the sporting world that it's all there's a lot of positive thinking, there's a lot of re- repetition of mantras. And there's a point where he, he uses that to carry him through some of the experiences he's going through. But there are things that you can't, you can't explain. Well, achievements consisted of, I mean, this is an incredibly hardworking, mm-hmm. driven guy. And yeah. he's hardworking and he's driven. Mm-hmm. And essentially, as far as his career goes, uh-huh. he's very much a journeyman. Yeah. You know? yeah. He's, not, he's not an NBA star. Right. Yeah. He's, right. he, he, he's a working athlete. Yeah. He's a working yeah. athlete who has done well to... Be, a, be paid for what he does. Right. Yeah. Um, but the fact that he ends up in Macedonia, <laughs> in France, yeah. well, um, and back he's... in the States, oh. in the fact that he ends up in Libya at all speaks to right. the fact right. that he hasn't succeeded on the highest level. But it's it's a reminder of um, the, the in sport that there's a whole wave of people you see as mediocre right. who are still exceptional. Yeah. Because the amount of people that want to succeed in in, in basketball, for example. Right, oh, yeah. Huge. Well, in those people that we would consider mediocre, just in comparison to, you know, the right. people with all the endorsement deals or whatever, are putting more work into it on a daily basis. The, and they're, they're a tiny amount below uh-huh. them, in terms of right. ability. Yeah. A tiny right. amount. Yeah. But that tiny amount... Because that door is, is so huge. Big. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the fact that for, like, throughout the various ebbs and flows of his career... And the kind of strange, impulsive decisions he makes, but like yeah. wherever he ends up, he's recalibrating his strategy. I mean, his, absolutely. His this you know, this will get me this for this year, but then next year I'm going to be here. yeah. Because the goal is is the NBA, and yeah. so you know up until this you know catastrophic shattering of the self that happens when he's confronting all this real life horror Absolutely. in libya it's always okay so that seems to knock me back a few steps but if i do this and this and this then i can get into the nba in the nba that way and which is like a 60 year old local actor uh-huh. in a theater production right. saying, you know now now i'm king lear this uh-huh. is this is my now i'm this, this if i do this king lear right. in this local theater production this 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 might be my shot because yeah. It's got some sponsorship and people might come. Right, right, and, right. And, and that, the, the Hollywood dream, the Broadway dream, uh-huh. might still be there. Right, right, right. But it's compressed into the first half of a life because athletes... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's the, the, the pressure on a teenager in. I mean, that's the thing that really... Yeah. Right, because well, you're like, looking for that window yeah. of peak like, physical He's leaving high school and he could yeah. go anywhere. Yeah. Right. He right, could, right. like he said, if he wanted to play football, he would have gone to Texas. If he uh-huh. wanted to play basketball, he could have gone to UCLA. Right. But he tried to do both. Yeah. And <laughs> academia. Yeah. And and that's because when you're a teenager, you don't know what you want to do. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. And you know, and I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that this is at all pertinent, but I just, I, I want to say it. Like, Lar- like uh, Lawrence Olivier talked about his uh, King Lear and how he felt like, like, uh, well, King Lear and Romeo to play Romeo. You need to be physically, you know, between like, you know, 15 and 21. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but you, to really understand the ironies of that character, you have to be between 30 and 40. Ha. And uh, so, and to. So no one can play it. Well, yeah. And to play King Lear, you, you know, you, like, you need the physical vigor of a, a 17 to 21 year old. Mm-hmm. And um, but you like can't get your head around it mentally until you're actually in your seventies. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so yeah. I think sporting genius uh-huh. often seems to be this um, genius that isn't understood. Like uh-huh. You can be an imbecile, right? And and understand the physics of how a ball moves. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not be able to explain it. You just do it. Right. And and I think sometimes that's where you see 
the the high school college kids who just understand something uh-huh. then they get to a point where they they doubt themselves for the first time and right. they're finished yeah it's done yeah, yeah. they have to That's think it. in that external yeah. sort of way and it's just you're done yeah. right what's the parable of the ants and the centipede you know and, yeah. yeah. How do you move all those legs all at once? And then as soon as you think about it, <laughs> wait, you're <finished>. wait a <laughs> minute, instantly crippled. Um, yeah. But uh, and something I'm I was thankful about in the book as a non sports person, but with this you know like renewed abiding you know admiration for what that that um, that path requires, but the play by play aspect mm-hmm. of a basketball narrative. That was really saved, like for the last climactic game. Yep, yep. You know, yeah. it goes there occasionally, just so we'll know what everyone's aptitudes reflect about their character and where they are in this pecking mm-hmm. order. But we didn't get a play-by-play basketball game with all the terminology and stuff until the like you know climactic game in Alexandria, yeah. where which you know, is by the book. Uh huh. Hollywood ending, yeah. isn't it? And that's I found that really interesting. That he, one of the greatest points in the book is when he he makes his escape from Libya to mm-hmm. Egypt under such duress. Yeah, he's desperate to get home, and his former yeah. coach, who has also escaped, says, "Come and play in Alexandria," and he does. Uh-huh. He makes his decision to not go home, but to stay for six weeks, two months, right, um, without seeing any of his family or his girlfriend. Yeah. And he stays to play basketball to get his head right. And then he not only does that, but he helps this team sweep to the playoffs right. and win the championship right. and win it you know, right at the end of the game yeah. with a shot right at the end. Um, the, um, I loved the um, almost the, the predictable um, excitement. You, um, you knew they were going to win, sure. Somehow, mm-hmm. even yeah. though this is nonfiction, yeah. Um, and the way in which somehow that, coupled with his dad recovering from his illness, it it, it put this incredible positive gloss on the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that somehow, um, in his own sporting world, his own yeah. personal sporting, you know, hit the world in which that's really important to him, which uh-huh. is sporting success. Right. He's he's come out of this experience and he survived. And, and everything's great again. Right. But the, there's all these questions to me about about um, what does it mean when he gets home? What, yeah. What does his, what does his girlfriend really think about right, him? Right, right, right. Deciding yeah. what to play basketball. What does it say about him? Yeah, yeah. What does he do now? Yeah. Well, I, um, you know, and, and it, but the, that ending, it, yeah. it, it almost made me feel like the ending of Taxi Driver when mm. when um, oh he's a hero. Travis and, Bickle yeah, has just yeah. just killed some people. Right. Right, and, uh, and he's getting letters from Jodie Foster's parents, parents saying, "Well then, done, you're a hero." Yeah, and it it puts this nice spin on something which was actually a blood. But heart. but it's but it's bittersweet yeah. it's and weird ending. because he's still sitting there. And, and it, I wouldn't room. say this was quite right. quite in that right round, but it, it gave me it made me think of that. Yeah, because it leads to these questions of right. Well, because his um, I mean, despite that he's laying it all out for us, and this is you know in his voice, what other kind of literary controversies uh, or you know conceits Daniel Paisner is imposing, that you know this feels like an authentic transcription of what mm-hmm. he went through, and there's um, you know he's learning things about himself, but there's there's just this this fundamental selfishness mm-hmm. to his character. And, you know, he's he's a religious person and he loves his family and he's respectful of what his family has given him. But I I think when you're that committed to when you've like found a verb that seems to define you and Mm -hmm. all of your hopes for the future or self-fulfillment or actualization, like hinge on your obsessive practice of that verb it like you know by necessity you know obviously makes you this you know very kind of myopic person Mm -hmm. and i could not after everything that because i mean you would think like his experiences in libya and what he witnessed and you know all this devastation and all this peril and him you know almost beating a man to death and recognizing yeah, this you know this yeah. yeah that uh that it would have like broken him down to this state i kept expecting the story to go that way uh-huh. where he's like i don't care about basketball anymore yeah. but so it it's like simultaneously sort of triumphant and exciting and empowering that he you know he again 
you know, like manages to put his psyche together through the sport that defines him. But at the same time, you, what you're not going back yeah, to your family. There's, your there's a denial dying. to the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. into, and I knew after uh, I read this book, I was going to look him up on Wikipedia to see uh-huh. where he is now because this all happened a couple of years ago. Right, right. And I knew he would still be playing basketball. Because so. <laughs> I just like bitches and blow too much. And, right. uh, you know, and the game fell by the wayside. But um, be that as it may, here I am with this book, sports and current events and all these things that, I, you know, I, I don't know if the average reader, like, needs such a stripped down um, sort of disconnected interface as we get with Alex Awumi, who is just all about the game and mm-hmm. all about his personal struggle and is in the middle of these great you know, like I- iconic history shifting moments um, that he's a sort of witness to, witnessing from the, you know, bombed out gutters and, and shattered windows of, of uh, you know, buildings looking out on these events. But, um, you know, uh, maybe the man in the street knows more about what was actually going down in Libya than I do. But I was dreading reading this to tell you the truth. <laughs> and, uh, but when I finally sat down with it, um, I was, uh, I was shocked at the, uh, literary quality of this memoir. And I'm sure, I'm not sure of Daniel Paisner's, uh, background as a, you know, as a ghostwriter or as a facilitator of, uh, of memoirs, but I feel like the raw material of a woomy struggle, you know, um, was... and clearly a very engaging personality. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I, I completely found him very likable. Oh no, yeah. super charming, yeah. and uh, and you know, and and a kind of abiding selfishness uh, in his view that I also found very engaging because it seemed part and parcel of of you know his character as an athlete. Absolutely. You know, and, and very much like an artist of any other kind. It seemed yeah. exactly the same, like right. the artist who escaped from from the Hitler's threat like mm. and they weren't involved on any side they just saw some shit going down and they were getting out right. if they could because yeah. they wanted to pursue their pursuits and yeah. you know they went to the American Southwest or they went wherever right, right, and like right, right. and and they just got out of there yeah. and and may or may not have had such incredible like uh-huh. incredible gotten into some, some incredible snaggles along right. the way like Alex here well, did well, and, and even <laughs> I mean apart from the burning cities and the shifting of history I mean just the pure athletic aspect of the memoir it really it like put you know um, a, a lot of my art, artistic writerly you know uh, sniveling in perspective <laughs> because I don't you know like I'll read the biographies of artists who have kind of, you know, spotty, ebbing and flowing, you know, periods of, of commitment and passionate obsession with their work, you know, for the most part. Um, but an athlete doesn't have that luxury. You can't do that. Yeah. No, you can't. <laughs> he, he, you know? I mean, I, I actually found a lot of the the early chapters where he was detailing his high school and college uh-huh. and then uh, uh, playing and, um, and subsequently his failure to be... Um, drafted in the NBA right found that really compelling yeah. because it's it, what do you do when you're a 17 18 19 year old guy uh-huh. physically very fit and he was he saw a point where he could have had it all right. in his mind right. whether whether he I mean he tells us he was a very he, he was a very good academic student um, he could have gone to possibly to an Ivy League school mm-hmm. um, could have played as a quarterback for a, for a college team could have right. played as a but you know he, he 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 wanted to have it all I and mean, there's a point where he ends up because he tries to hedge his bets so yeah, much, um, yeah. maybe failing. Right. Well, yes. And to remark briefly on you know how you know how remarkable I mean his array of aptitudes was uh-huh. that he was yeah. a, a great basketball player, a great football player. And because of his, you know, father, you know, his parents imposing these, you know, these, these values on him. I mean, he, like, like academic excellence mm-hmm. was not like something he just took it as a given that that was part of the mix. And, yeah. you know, he was like driving himself to be a great man, you know, yeah. but in, you know, in the language of the book, in this, you know, kind of, um, uh, um, slow dribbling kind of sauntering swaggering sort of way but you know if you break down what his actual in a way with 
you know, hundred percent. We're gonna keep keep yeah. getting more than the opposite team. There are things if the you opposite can't train team for. have yeah. guns and yeah. they're raping someone, and you're just yeah. gonna you, you're gonna cry quietly in your apartment. Yeah, you know? and, and your own image you of do. yourself, like your way that you think of yourself, is completely not applicable. You can't apply it to this situation. Right. You'd think mm. maybe you could, <clears throat> but instead you're a helpless baby. In, but, in but, and yet he keeps in it, I guess it's uh, to survive and to, and to make sense of what's what he's been through. He he keeps um, uh, f finding this narrative, this kind of almost redemptive narrative that that um, that that plays against a lot of the reality. Because this isn't a book that really explains to us what what was going on in Libya. He's very much a naive guy who likes mm. to play basketball, yeah. um, and 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 came out of Libya with not really any more understanding of the place than he went in with he, he's this confused um guy trapped in a very strange situation and and he and he kind of bounces around um based on the luck and judgment and goodwill of other people in a way that um it's, it's this kind of almost this kind of picaresque novel it's almost like candide where it's mm -hmm. this guy bouncing around and and the the irony of the the deeper things that are happening to people around him, the terrible mm. things that are happening that right. he manages to um, avoid. Um, a, there, there are almost two narratives. There's there's the one that, that he's writing for himself, the personal one, mm -hmm. where he's maybe discovered some things about himself by surviving this ordeal, right. yeah. and the one that's happening to the world at large. Yeah, like what was actually going on, and when he's it's stuck in the apartment, and mm. he doesn't know. Who these like the soldiers out there? What side are they? Like, and what, like, side what is does he it on? Mean? What yeah. side and is the side? What, yeah, what side is the side? What like he doesn't even know what how he is perceived. Like, yeah. what side he would be perceived because he to just be plays on? Basketball. Yeah, right. and so I mean, he <laughs> is living in in a Qaddafi family apartment. However, the teams are basically half slaves. And abused by the Qaddafis. So, right. how do you even know what someone on the other side, someone from the country who doesn't speak your language, right. what they even think about you? Do they think of you as an American? Do they think of you as part of the Qaddafis? Right. Like, and, well, why are they? Why are they not killing him? We'll never find out. Well, we won't. The sporting world is not one where you can sell out. You, the, the mm. concept of, of morality in sport is so dubious at best where you you know you sign deals with people you you know if, if you were is there a, a completely altruistic and moral sport that's organized by moral and altruistic people no you you, you just play yeah right. or maybe in the bush leagues I mean in its in its purest state like when he speaks of falling in love with the sport of basketball in mm -hmm. Nigeria oh yeah it's this beautiful the game thing. itself yeah. yeah yeah and he's uh, and there are these pirated VHS tapes being brought to him from the United States absolutely the glamour of America yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. where he uh, you know but uh, but I think I mean for that reason because he's sort of outside the moral questions of these struggles yeah. that he's a witness to He's a great interface for for the reader. Absolutely, I mean, at least for this reader. I mean, Absolutely, hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, as you said, Mark, I you know I, I don't um, I don't really read books like this very often. And um, Kate, I don't know if I mean if if you you know have more of a nonfiction palette in general. I love to read nonfiction, but it's um, usually about subjects that I'm personally engaged with, right? Like, like the arts or yeah. the arts. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, but uh, yes, and, and this book um, was, uh, you know, uh, recommended to me uh, by Kevin Undergaro. And, uh, and I was leery at first because it's about sports, which I know nothing about. And it's well, you, about... you don't like to talk about your, your college uh -huh. you know uh, scholarships uh, I'm not going to bring that up no. because uh, there's some very painful memories attached to that mm -hmm. I had it all you know like uh, the world in the palm of my hand and yet I blew it because